this, this is the extent of what I can. Good afternoon. Evening. Afternoon. Hi, everybody. We're, we're going to go ahead and get started. Jessica, I hope you can hear that feedback. OK. Everybody, welcome to our first plenary. Uh, we are still missing a panelist, so hopefully he'll be joining us shortly. I wanted to take just a quick moment, uh, one, to point out one logistical thing, and then also to talk a little bit about why we're all here today. So I've been getting a lot of questions. Where is my room number? What's next? What's happening? With the exception of Georgina Escobar's session, which already happened where there was a room change, and like, we, we get it, I'm so sorry. Um, everything is in the program, yeah? So, <laughs> it's I, it's in the syllabus. 100% promise, it's all here. So, if you're ever confused, my, my first, you know, look here, and if you're still confused, then come find one of us. Actually, then go find somebody else, and then come find one of us. I'm the third, I'm the fourth step, okay? Just because it's, it's gonna make everybody's lives a lot easier. It's all here, no drama, okay? Great. So. I wanted to give just a moment to sort of go, why are we here? How did we get here? You know, what is this thing? So back in 2016, the Latinx, well, were we Latinx Theater Commons? Yes, we were. We had just become Latinx Theater Commons, maybe. We had just finished a cycle of our first programming. We had done an event in Boston, in Los Angeles, in Chicago. We had done two regional events in Dallas and in Seattle. And we were like, what's next? And so we started taking proposals for new projects, OK? One of those proposals came from Roxanne Schroeder Arce. Now, Roxanne was not a steering committee member of the LTC at that time. She was a friend of the LTC, as many of you are. She came to convenings. She was on social media. She was writing for Cafe Onda, which was our journal at the time on HowlRound. But she wasn't on the steering committee. But she had this idea and this passion and this space and these resources and all this stuff, right? So. <laughs> okay, I can speed it up now. My vamping's over. Um, <laughs> um, and she put forth this project as an option for the steering committee. <coughs> People put in proposals. We met in Seattle over three arduous days <laughs> and decided what we were going to do. And this project clearly rose to the top. Okay? Um, from there, the steering committee sort of mobilized. We started thinking about dates. We started thinking about planning, sort of going backwards from the day of, forming a host committee. Emily came on as a, as a co-champion. And we brought in Teatro Vivo, and things started rolling from there. But I just want to tell that story because sometimes when you go to these events, it's very easy to be like, oh, it, just, it was just this big power that, that, that be that, that decided they wanted to do this thing. No. It was, it was Roxanne who was like, this thing should happen. The <laughs> Latinx Theater Commons should be the ones that help do it. And I'm just going to tell you that, and I'm going to give you a budget. So <laughs> <laughs> and then she joined the steering committee because Obviously, in order to make the thing happen, she has to be in the room, right? So I tell that story just to say, like, that's how our events happen. Sometimes it's formula, you know, a little bit more formula. Sometimes it's uh, more organic. But that's why we're all here today, because a pitch came in in April 2016 for a cool project like this. And here we are. So speaking of Roxanne, I'm going to hand it over to her to start us off and introduce our amazing panelists for our first plenary. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing indeed. Uh, wow. Like, uh, just, just, just look at <laughs> This is really uh, quite an honor. And I am so, so grateful to be with all of you and to be here with you. And I cannot wait to hear what you have to say. Um, I have been following all of your work for such a long time. And it's so great to have you here. So um, just want to introduce the panelists. Um, to tell you a little bit about them. Uh, we are focusing this panel on the roots of Latinx and Latin American TYA, Theater for Young Audiences. We're gonna do some discussion about what is that? And more importantly, why do you all do this work? And what has been your experience? And how do we do it better? How do we do more? How do we make it happen? And these folks are the folks who know. So um, first of all, uh, we have next to me the amazing Jose Casas, who is a playwright. We know his work. We love his work. Um, assistant professor, and uh, he leads 
the minor in playwriting in the Department of Theater and Drama at the University of Michigan. And also, um, Cece, or Jose, will be talking uh, about his new anthology, Palabras del Cielo, um, here at the festival. So we are so, so excited about that. Oscar Franco is a K-12 teacher here in Austin, and he has focused He's focused on the arts as a tool to support culturally responsive teaching and community-centered learning with right here in Austin. And he just got back from New York and we're like, come back, and he did. And Oscar, <laughs> Oscar's also on the board of Teatro Vivo. Um, and then, of course, we have our amazing, I don't know if you've all met him, but Marco Novello is um, <coughs> my dear friend and um, is an artisan of words and a chronicler of possible words. And he teaches at. That sounds <laughs> pretty. That's pretty good. Um, I didn't write it. And he teaches <laughs> at uh, Anahuac University in Mexico, and um, and flew in last night. So thank you for being here, um, Miriam Gonzalez. If you don't know Miriam's work, um, you should. And uh, <laughs> Miriam's a playwright from Washington D.C. And Miriam is a Tahana at heart. So welcome back to Texas. Uh, Miriam is from Corpus Christi, and, um, and we are just so happy to have you here. And I am in love with your play, as you know, um, The Smartest Girl in the World, and others. So thank you. And we're, we're going to hear Miriam's play, uh, Oyame the Beautiful, tomorrow. Yes. And next to Miriam, Jose Cruz Gonzalez, the legend, um, a playwright from the US, teaches theater at Cal State University, Los Angeles. Next to our Jose is the awesome Diana Guisado. Diana is a Mexican artist who studies here in the Department of Theater and Dance with an emphasis on performance in, uh, and, and we are just so happy. So it's, it, and you, you're seeing Diana, she's in both of the readings of new plays. So thank you, Diana. How's the sound? Awesome, okay, <laughs> Stephanie, thank you. Um, okay, so. Here we go. So we wanted to start with a question, and there's gonna be some opportunity for you all to ask these amazing artists, teachers, scholars um, questions as well. But um, first a little bit about why you do the work that you do. So we're starting there. Like what inspires you? What experiences have you had that have said, do this work, do work for young people in the US, in Latin America, what inspires you to do that? What makes you do the work that you do? And Diana, we're gonna start with you, please. So what experiences have you had? <coughs> what has made you stay in this work? Y sabes que si quieren hablar en español está bien y no, está bien, es perfecto. Gracias. Well, first of all, it's just an honor to be here with this <laughs> amazing people. I feel like I don't belong here, but. Um, you do belong here. <laughs> Um, I'm originally from Mexico and I have always loved to create um, theater um, and then I moved four years ago um, because my parents decided to and I realized that it was possible for me to study theater to keep doing this work um, but of course um, as years went by I realized the lack of representation uh, the lack of stories that showed other experiences, other bodies, other other people um, that I was living with. Um, and I do this because I believe that art can change people, art can connect us and bring empathy and just hopefully create a better world. And. I noticed that TYA is so important because if you inspire that in the children, then you can raise human beings that ca can create a world that is more, that has more humanity. And that's why I want to keep doing this work, to represent, to unite, to, to find something else in this world that is just so crazy. How do we bring more love? And I think art is a way to do so. Yeah. Yes. So we can go down the line, or if one of you wants to answer that question, we don't all have to answer the question. Uh, so um, 
Jose? Sure. Um, gosh, I think about the first time I ever saw, I think, a piece of theater was, I think I was maybe a kindergartner, and I we were sitting down on the grass out here on, on, in, in our elementary school, and my brother ends up walking out, and he's green. <laughs> And he was performing, and I knew nothing about that my brother was in a play and that he was green. <laughs> and I was just so fascinated by him being green. So that's my only memory of theater as a child. But it wouldn't be actually until I was in college and was introduced to the Chicano theater um, by Jorge Huerta, Dr. Huerta at UC San Diego. And so I was a student of him and learned about the teatro movement. And, and once I discovered that, I was like, OK, I want to work with Teatro Campesino. I want to work at Teatro Esperanza, and that was my goal. Um, and But it wouldn't be that route that I would end up going to. I'd actually go to a regional theater company, South Coast Repertory. And it was there that we started a program called the Hispanic Playwrights Project. And that program was dedicated to developing plays by Latino writers here in the United States. And um, it lasted for 19 years. I was really proud that that program continued, that, that, that lasted 19 years. Um, but while there, one of the things I started to do was to work in the communities, uh, uh, teaching theater to young people. And I remember when we first started, a colleague of mine, Lori Woolery, was there, a young artist at that time, learning her craft. And we ended up having 200 children show up. And I said, OK, we've got two hours to do this. I said, so this is how we're going to do it. We broke it down. She reminded me about this uh, about a week ago. And she says, I've never taught before. I said, you know more than they do, so get in there. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it opened up a door for me seeing what we were doing with the adults in theater, trying to open that door for our Latinx artists, but realizing that there was nothing there for young people. And so that then took me on that journey of going, wow, this would be, we should, we've got to do something about that. And that's how I sort of entered the field and began to understand the field of TYA. <clears throat> Who's eager to talk? Um, that just your story, <coughs> how you first your first theater experience reminded me too of how I growing up in Corpus uh, in, in in the seventies and there was no theater for young audiences for us and so really my first experience was on my grandmother's knee watching novelas, mm -hmm. telenovelas, mm -hmm. and um, just being so excited by the drama, the <laughs> slamming doors and all the kissing and, uh, you know, <laughs> it was just like, it was, I was enthralled and, um, and then I, my grandmother's house was right across the street from a huge drive-in. So there was a huge, the huge screen was right there and we would sit in the driveway. I remember we'd eat these pomegranates from the tree that would fall into the driveway and we'd just crack them open and eat and we would make, we couldn't hear anything, we could see Cantinflas, and we, it was all Spanish because it was in the barrio, and it was all uh, uh, Spanish movies. And we would put words in. My brother and, and my my neighbor, and we put we would put in the dialogue because we couldn't hear the movies. So that I was naturally loved theater my whole life, and was always very dramatic and full of imagination. But I that's what I loved. But I I when I went into college and in graduate school, and and through high school, I and I and I started reflecting back on my childhood. I realized there was never any sort of education for us on who we were as a people in Corpus Christi, uh, even though we're a majority minority city. We weren't in the curriculum. We weren't in, 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 on television. We, we, I, wasn't, I didn't see myself anywhere. And so um, I come from a very political family. My dad was a state rep here in, in Texas for a while. And so we were always um, thinking about uh, inequalities and, and what we had to do for fi to fight for representation. And I, as I got older, I realized that where it all can kind of hit home is in education, where we can democratize and equalize. And so I went into education, and I really, I, I focused my dissertation on the dearth of material and curriculum for Latinos and, Lat and literature. I just didn't see anything, and I, I wanted to understand how could we fill that gap. And I wanted to see where teachers, what teachers were doing to address and celebrate diversity, and how were they embracing diversity in the classroom, and how were they making it higher order thinking, and how are you bringing in complexities, and I was really, I was just very interested in that, and so from there, I um, moved on with my life, and I uh, went, into, went to Washington, I was an educator, but then I got, I crossed, uh, my world's crossed with Karen Zacharias in, in D.C., 
and she gave me the same thing where she, I was in the theater, I was a teacher, and I was in between things, and I said, God, I love your theater, uh, your white, young playwrights theater. She started in DC, and I said, um, she's like, you're a teacher, right? I said, yeah, I said, and I love theater. She's like, come teach with us. And I said, well, but I've only written plays with kids in the classroom. She's like, baptism by fire. <laughs> get in there, get in there. All they need is someone that's gonna listen to them. They want someone that makes them feel they belong. These kids, they just need someone to listen to them. And so I taught with them as a, as a, as a teaching artist for six years, and I started writing myself and was asked to write some plays. Um, and it just started, went from there, and I, uh, just actually very lucky to run into incredible mentors like Karen Zacarias, um, Jose Cruz Gonzalez, Jenny Millinger, and David Sarr, Child's Play, um, and Dwayne Hartford, and, and I just got into this world and I was just very, very lucky. And, and also Kennedy Center, uh, David Kilpatrick and Ken Peter, just really been so supportive. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just inc I realized the importance of mentors and, and gracious people who give their time and that we all have to lift each other up and connect each other. And um, I think that's is why this is so exciting here, um, because this is important work that we do, and um, it's time that we're heard and that we're seen. So it's, it's exciting. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, uh, I guess everything started when I was a little kid. Uh, my parents took us to a theater show for kids. In Mexico and it was the first time I went to the theater and I sat on the uh, chair lights went off the curtain went up and suddenly <coughs> something magical happened because there was a forest behind that curtain and magical creatures start popping all over the place and I oh, went just like that and <laughs> it was just so emotional i don't know if the company was any good at all <laughs> really i couldn't but the the impression that makes in that little kid it was so strong uh that carry on until today i guess so just uh when i start acting uh at the university, I had the chance to go to hospitals to perform for kids that were uh, <coughs> with cancer and uh, terminal disease and seeing their faces and how they light up with this magic that's a theater uh, just hooked me into theater for children. So I've been doing this for le the last 30 years almost, uh, uh, so I think it's the opportunity to get in touch with another soul and change its li his life or her life, uh, even though it can last just days before they, they die, but uh, it's a very strong opportunity to make a very strong impression in somebody that's clear of Prodigist and stuff like that. So I guess it's the best theater in the world. <laughs> you can shake your maraca. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my key. Are you here? I think the moment that sticks out to me the most uh, is related. I, I'm a, as a teacher, like education in school has been what moves me and it has been like schedules and all that stuff just like it's exciting for some reason um and and i realized that uh as i was going through like public education as i then started going into when i went to here to ut for college i started to see a separation between myself and my family um a separation between my uh my parents who uh did not go uh beyond high school and 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 they had an education in Mexico and from their perspective it wasn't what they had hoped for so they were uh, was we're always hoping for more and I was able to live out that dream of 
graduating from high school and then coming in um, to the university and then now working as a teacher, but there was always a separation uh, from my what became my academic self and, and, and the roots that I came from and the roots that were in my own home. And in high school, when I started to do, I started to be involved in the arts and music and, and theater, and that's, that was the key and that was the door that opened for my parents to come into more of my life. Um, they couldn't help me academically. They couldn't help me then um, in uh, a permission slip that was in English, um, something as simple as that. And, and the arts and theater and music were the things that, that, that they could understand. Whether they knew the language or not, they could see on stage what was going on and understand the story and understand without that barrier of Spanish or English. Um, and they were able to see that and that was powerful for me to be able to have my family be a part of that, be a part of my life in, 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 in that way. Um, and then when I, be, when I came to UT, uh, I took a, uh, one of my first classes, my first semester was Latino TYA uh, that was taught by Roxanne. <laughs> and that completely changed my life and it changed, I think, the trajectory of what <coughs> I even had for myself. Um, and through that, my parents have been able to see some of the work that I've, that I've done and, and I've been able to have those conversations with them more about what goes on in my life and, and, uh, and now that's sort of what I hope to do also as a teacher, to not have my students wait until they're in high school or college to be able to share with their families a part of their life, um, but be able to have that at the elementary school level and be able to have their families go to events and be proud of, of, of the culture and, and, and and the experience of just being in a, in a space uh, with an open heart and open mind, um, and to be able to have that from the very beginning. Um, so my sort of going into it started from that and hopefully continues um, into that in, in that uh, kind of work. Um, I didn't grow up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't grow up knowing theater, didn't care about theater, got to college, didn't care about theater. Um, <laughs> but somehow, uh, magically and accidentally, um, I discovered theater in college. And the second I did that, I said to myself, oh shit, what did I just do? Yeah. And I actually reached out to a bunch of Latino directors and writers just to like, for consejos. I didn't know what I was doing. And I reached out to a lot of people and only three responded. And one of them, the one who took me under his wing the most is, Jose Cruz Gonzalez, so um, now he's stuck with me forever. Um, and so, you know, I discovered theater. I'm like, oh, okay, now I'm a writer. And um, I went to Arizona State for my graduate degree in playwriting. And so, um, if you all know, Arizona State has one of the best programs in theater for young audiences. And so, uh, a lot of the students were my friends, and they said, you need to write for youth. And I'm like, fuck you. Um, <laughs> honestly, I'm being honest. I'm like, I'm not gonna write for kids. I'm a real writer. <laughs> that was that was my thought, and they nagged me to the point where I'll write. Okay, I'll try it. And so my thesis play was a hip hop spoken word play, which literally was my first one. And I see one of the actors who was in that play right here, Ricky Rice. Oh, no. And um, so it was cool. And then I'm like, okay, I did it. I'm gonna go be a real writer again. And um, but I kept getting commission, and people kept asking me to write for youth. And then I slowly started to drink the Kool Aid. <laughs> and and realized that you know when I, I love writing for this group and every time I wrote for this group I thought of my nephews my nieces or my friends kids and then I realized that there was an extra added sense of responsibility for writing for this group that I embraced and to me not only is TOA an important theater I think it's the most important theater and it has so many strings attached to it whether it's it's you know putting up stories uh, building audiences whatever and I really embrace that and then getting into Latino theater for young audiences um, a lot of my work everything I do is based on diversity whether it's me teaching or writing or advocating and because I hate having that feeling of being the only one in my room and I know when my students come to me in tears that's exactly what they're feeling so it was my just not just being an educator writer but being an advocate for these stories that are underrepresented you know and I have way too many degrees and a lot of student loans and never once have I ever taken a class about a different culture's theater in theater, in the theater departments I've been in. That's a lot of, there's like a lot of years. And that's not acceptable at all. So, um, so it was my goal and has been my goal to continue to just do this work just because it's so important and everyone's stories deserve a space. 
And I also, though, with that kind of work, it's also not only celebrating, but also calling people out, calling the system out, because you know when we talk about TYA, diversity, we're worse than adult theaters. That should tell you something right there. And that has to change. So one of the things, you know, when I talk about diversity, I'm like, I'm tired of allies. I don't acknowledge allies anymore. That's cool that you're with us, but we need accomplices. That's what we need, because we need to change this, because if we're going to advocate for kids, the people who create the art and facilitate the art should look like that as well. So, yeah. OK, shake it. Shake it. OK, well, thank you. And um, we have plenty of Kool-Aid. <laughs> so drink and drink and drink. Um, so a lot. So thinking about that, uh, I I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the the process we we came we went we came across we went through to to come here and to think about what is the purpose because there are so many different definitions and ideas and what is TYA and. Does that include youth, and what does that mean, and what is Latinx TYA, and then, okay, we're doing this uh, uh, Festival of the Americas, and what does that mean, and what, okay, so it's Latin American TYA, but what does that mean, too, right? And how does that, how, how do we think of Latinx and Latin American coming together, and how are those both two things that are totally different and also similar uh, in some ways? So. Um, so Emily uh, and Abigail and I had lots of discussions, and then the steering committee, and then of course we had um, a committee that was the uh, selection committee of the five pieces, and then also a programming committee. So a lot of thinking went into this, and a lot of thinking, well, my brain was going, I don't know, a lot. Um, and so uh, one of those one of those pieces is thinking about what is the intervention? What are we trying to do here? And for a while, and Cece and Jose, we've been working on in, in some of the TYA world, right? Thinking about how do we diversify um, what is happening there? How do we think about having more theater of color for young people, and specifically Latinx theater for young people? And, um, and we very consciously thought about this space as being a space where we want to think about our teatros, our, our Latino theater companies, thinking about doing more work for young people. Because what we see happening throughout the US, and I'm eager to hear more about what's happening in Mexico, um, and then of course we, we have little representation of other Latin American on this panel we have, um, but certainly at the festival we do. Um, they're in rehearsal right now, but, mm -hmm. um, but we, uh, uh, the idea is also that a lot of our TYA, our Latinx TYA, is being done in historically white theater companies, right? And so um, while, okay, that's, you know, those companies need to be thinking about diversity and representation, sometimes those companies are checking boxes, to be really honest. We know that, and some of those companies are doing something because they really believe in it, and they really want to change, and they want to move forward, and great, that's awesome too. So we, we want all of that to happen, and we feel like our intervention here, though, is really thinking about our teatros, and, and how are we putting theater forward for young people, and that's happening, that's, that's our, our teatros throughout the, the country are doing more theater for young people, but some are saying, we don't know how. Or is it even viable? Are people going to come? How do we sell this work? How do we make it happen? Um, how do we even engage with schools and young people? We don't know how to do that. So some of what we want to do is discuss how are we going to do that. And Emily is going to lead a panel that's going to talk a little more about that. But, um, but just along those lines, like what, how do you define the work? Where are you seeing it? Where do you wish you, su you see more? And what are some of the obstacles that you're coming up against and some of the spaces where you're just being, you're just on fire and, and it's like, this is happening. Let's, let's make more of this. And, and these are the avenues where we, we've been able to and these are the avenues where you have to really push. Who'd like to talk about that? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, good. Um, <coughs> Thank you for that. That's, that's really great to help frame it for us. Uh, 
Um, I think for me, the, the, the thing is, is I've, I've had the, the great fortune of uh, being involved in festivals. And I think that's really important for our writers, uh, having those opportunities to be at the Kennedy Center, at, the, at Right Now, um, at NYU. Any of these programs, they're really important for our artists to get further developed. Um, and then, of course, you know, people come to those festivals to see the work, and then those opportunities happen for those artists to perhaps go on and, and work with those institutions. And, and I have to say that, that what happened to me with Child's Play and, and uh, David Zarr <coughs> many years ago, and so we've had that ongoing relationship mm -hmm. since 1997, but I, oh, I want to focus on um, Teatro del Pueblo, which is a, a small Latino theater company, Latinx company, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it's run by Alberto Justiano. And Alberto reached out to me many, many years ago and said, you know, I want to do a play here for, th for young audiences, um, and we want to commission you. And Alberto, you know, it's a small little company, and he has to raise those resources to, you know, pay a commissioned playwright. And uh, and every time I've gone back, that's what Al does, and he brings that theater to to his community. And I think that he is a really wonderful model to look at in terms of I'm going to bring new work here to my community. And he commissioned me about two, three years ago to write Curious. And he said to me, I want women in science. Can you write something about that? And that's what Curious is about. And I'm still waiting for Al to raise that money. He said, you know, you can go and get it done someplace else. And I said, no, I, I'd, I'd like to do it with you because you committed to me, and I'm going to commit to you. And so that, I would say, is, is a, a wonderful example of a company that sees the big picture, knows its community, but also understands the field. Mm. And I think that's important. Thank you. Uh, I didn't mention we we're going to see Jose's work on Saturday, of course, Tomas and the Library Ladies, so, um, which is was commissioned by Child's Play, no? Or was it? Yes, yes, yes commissioned. Yes, yeah. How many, when was that? What year? We, we did that in 2006. It premiered there, and uh, so it's had a life o over, the, uh, over those years. Uh, and uh, it, it actually was really wonderful in that as an example of an outsider coming to, ch to Child's Play, a librarian. Uh, Tim was his name. I can't remember Tim's last name. Um, but he came knowing th this book, The Moss and the Library Lady, that had been written by Pat Mora. And it was an illustrated book. Uh, David asked me, would you take a look at it? And I sort of flipped through it, you know, really quickly, bought the book and read it. I was like, okay, I know that story, you know? <laughs> you know, farm working kid, that sort of thing. And, and um, but I said to David, let me take a look at it a little bit more so. Thank God we went to the archive here today at this university, the Latinx 100 years. Please go take a look at it if you haven't. Um, I went to the uh, um, Tomas Rivera archive at UC Riverside, because he was the first Chicano to, to be a chancellor of a major university of California. And so his materials were there. And what a resource to go in there and to see this man's life, his materials there, and to then suddenly realize there's a bigger story here. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to David and said, yes, I think we can tell the story. It's, it's here. Um, and so, you know, it was a, a wonderful merging. I'll be interested to see what you think after, you know, I haven't seen it in years. See, does it still hold up? That'd be my, my question to you. <laughs> so, and, and I'll just stay on that for just a second because when we say it has had a life, right? The, the playwrights here are all going, you know that that's what that means. Um, what does that what does that mean? Tomas and the Library Lady since two thousand six. Do you have any like can, how many? Like I want to know. I'll research this in, in a, sometime, but or someone else um, because we need to document this work. But um, how many young people? Any idea? I'm going to take a guess. Uh, Jenny might know, but I'm I'm I've sort of Hi, approximated Jenny. maybe a couple hundred thousand, maybe more than uh, two hundred three. Shake your maraca at that. <laughs> Yay. Mm. <laughs> Shake your maraca. <laughs> Jenny Millinger said, 
half a million young people have seen Tomás and the Library Lady since wow. 2006. Ooh. Great. So Great. I asked a really big question, and, and somehow Jose, you know, took something from that. So I, what about more? The definitions, where is the work being done? How is it being done? Where are the spaces where the doors open? Where are the spaces where there's friction? How do we, how do, what's, how's it happening? How's it happening for you? How's it happening? Oh, um, I struggle with it, personally, because, uh, you know, I keep getting published and stuff, but no one keeps them in the place. And so, and the work I've done where I really have found uh, communities are community-based theaters, not TYA theaters. Um, Rising Youth Theater, which is here. I am a resident artist with Spinny Thought, which takes a international model of TYA as their mission statement. So for me, that's it's, it's a little bitter. I don't know. I don't want to sound bitter, but that's where my work and that's where the experiences I'm having as a playwright are are more satisfying or satisfactory because they go into communities and ask what's wrong, and then you build off of that rather than uh, looking for a title or something like that. Mm. And they really don't think of those conventions or how is this going to sell. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. just let's 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 work in this community. So that's where I feel the strongest tie right now. Um, in terms of overall, I, I think it's still we still need to get there. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Love well, I, I would like to talk a little bit about my experience, and I'm talking about my experience because it's very hard to talk about the theater of a country for just one point of view. Mm -hmm. um, I used to be president of ACITESH, Mexico, from 2000 to, till 2011. And I faced uh, a country without the knowledge of a movement, a world movement that is theater for mm -hmm. children and young people. And uh, in that 11 years, I fought. <laughs> all day long, <laughs> every year to organize something. But uh, companies in Mexico, I guess, and theater is just a reflection of the reality of a whole country. Everybody's uh, very individualist. They're, they don't see theater uh, for children and young people as a movement. And uh, they don't believe I guess we don't have the culture of getting together, <laughs> of uh, fighting as a group. Uh, so it was very hard. <laughs> Just trying to uh, get information about how many groups in the country were doing theater for children and young people, it was <laughs> hard. <laughs> uh, at the end of uh, the time I, I was uh, president, we couldn't find out. We were uh, figures around 400, 500 groups around the whole country, but groups uh, develop one day and finish the other. <laughs> so it was hard. And also I think it's a policy the cultural institutions are doing now that fighting against this kind of theater, independent theater, diverse theater, because they try to put everybody in a box. They uh, make you do a project, putting all you need to do a shop, a uh, 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 staging, a play, and for every hundred uh, people that apply, just maybe 10 got sponsored. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you learn as an independent group is that you can't do theater if they don't fund you. So it's kind of uh, weird. I think they're missing the point. Uh, instead of uh, fomentar, I don't know how you call it, uh, promote the creation, new creation and diverse creation, 
they just funding very specific kind of work. It's just one line of uh, creation and uh, making think, uh, making these groups think they're not able to create, mm -hmm. to be diverse. So conditions to be an uh, independent theater for children and young people here now in Mexico are very aggressive, I guess. For example, I, I did a show on October and they pay me that show until December. And you never know when they're gonna pay you. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. How can you live to do a show when you don't know if they're gonna pay you and when they're gonna pay you? So it's hard. Uh, so I think something's gotta change there. Uh, when I left uh, Asitesh, somebody else got uh, to be president, but now I think there's no more president in Asitesh, Mexico. So it's a big issue there. Uh, because nobody wants to work for free. <laughs> Uh, Roxanne was there a couple of times, uh, Roger Bedard and many people went for a colloquium I organized because I, I tried to work in the universities to make uh, people understand, people that are uh, studying theater, that TYA is a big issue all over the world. Nobody believes that. <laughs> So it was a big struggle uh, that I fought in the universities. And until today, there's only out of 27 universities in the country that teach theater, acting, or something like that, there's only two that have a course in theater for children. That's amazing. Any courses. Incredible. Any courses or the full program? Any courses? No, just one course. Oh. So it's, it's a, we have a lot of work to do there, <laughs> I yes. guess. So Marco, just to dig in a little further, so I, because I want to understand. So when you talk about diversity, are you talking about diversity in form? Or are you talking about diversity of representation of, of culture, language, race, ethnicity, within all of the people of Mexico? I guess both. Both. Because uh, people don't believe that, but Mexico is a very racist country, very classist country. And uh, like, like I said before, uh, theater is just a reflection of the reality of a country. Uh, in Mexico, we have a big issue with uh, inequality. Mm -hmm. There's a very small group of people with a lot of money, and there's a very, very large amount of people with nothing. <laughs> and uh, that happens also in theater. Mm -hmm. You have some groups that have all the funds, and you see the same names having the uh, awards and stuff, and a large amount of actors and groups that can't even stage a play. Mm -hmm. So it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. the, the diversity is in all, mm -hmm. all concepts. And I know I've had the benefit of seeing some of your work, and I know you have, um, like we have, well, we have Guatilique, which we're gonna see, um, also, you have indigenous themes in much of your work. What about in other, in other plays? And Diana, um, having seen a lot of Mexican work as well, perhaps you want to speak about some of the work that you've experienced or participated in as well. Um, and different themes, um, different representations on these stages for young people and what that means in Mexico. Oh, well, uh, first time I teach my, my first work, uh, based on uh, Aztec mythology. It's called Mictlan. Uh, it's about 
uh, the trouble of a god, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent to the underworld. And people told me, you're talking about death for TYA? Are you crazy? <laughs> But, uh, so they didn't want to support <coughs> that. <laughs> uh, I mainly wanted to be a uh, playwright when I start at the university, but I had to direct and produce an act because nobody wanted to stitch the place. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, now they're a little more uh, common, but back in the 80s, 90s, when I start that, it was weird for everybody. Uh, they say, why? You look to the past. We have to look forward to the future. But I think, as I wrote in the article, uh, uh, that mythology goes very deep in your unconscious, social unconsciousness, and uh, talks about us very deeply and asks and answers questions that have been there for centuries or more. So uh, you, just have to, you just have to context that. Uh, Bertolt Brecht uh, used the, how do you call it, distanciamiento? Uh, alienation. Just put some distance so you can look at the reality from a different point of view and find different things. If you're so close, you can't look at it. So trying to write f things from the past gives you that ability to have a distance and think a little bit more, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. From your perspective, anything to um, share? Yeah, it, it's just very interesting and also it's just n not fair to see because when I, you, when you live in Mexico, you just go through all of it and don't stop to think about it because you don't have the resources or the knowledge or mm. all this literature that can teach you that there are other things out there and that some things are just not fair. Um, and when I was there, all the things that my school produced or the things that I used to watch with my parents in Mexico City were all based in American stories, uh, white stories. Um, mm -hmm. I remember the first play I saw was this play of Tom Sawyer, for example. <laughs> and uh, that was in Mexico, yes. And that's like theater for youth. Um, and then in my school, we always produce like Beauty and the Beast. And then <laughs> I remember doing like, uh, they did the play, they did Grease. And the, the yep. <laughs> 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 and the, the main character, um, she was a very talented actress and, but her hair was brown and people, got angry at the producers for having a girl who was not blonde in the, <laughs> like, the yes. main role. So, and these things are so <laughs> complex and you try to explain to people, but since we don't have that culture and that um, exposure to other type of work, people don't understand. And so you have to go out, come here, see, meet all of these artists, to realize there's something wrong and I do want to go back to Mexico and change something and show that there, there are different ways. And also, mm -hmm. of course, men are in charge of many yeah. things over there and there's a lot of racism Class. and it's just, it is very, very complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so we're gonna check that shift gears a little bit, just to, to this idea of what, what if you're doing the work, is it viable? So Cece mentioned, right, who's doing the work, it's not, it's not being produced, but um, I'm gonna turn to you, um, Oscar, and ask about like what, as a teacher, um, I know like 
we didn't have a lot of time to bring these young people, but the schools jumped at it, right? So what is that? What is it? Is it viable? Uh, who's responding to the work? Um, as a teacher, what what is the need out there? And um, and then also, can you get can you get funds? Can you get your children, your youth, to get to get them to the theater? Or how does that work? Yeah. Um and I, I think this is something that every year that I have always and I always have to think about every year, um, including this one where I'll be I'll be bringing in um, some of my students for tomorrow and had to think about okay bus how are we going to get funds for this bus you know and finding what are the resources and how can I show that bringing students to this event to this experience um, does relate to everything else that these f other funds or that this thing is for. Um, there's a, a particular uh, moment that comes to mind um, that I, I worked in elementary school here in, in Austin and obviously a lot of the work that, that I wanted to bring to them was Latinx based and, and for a lot of families that had never happened. Um, and I remember that there was a student that I had who had a lot of, had a lot of different needs, a lot of different things uh, and, and constantly struggled in school. Um, he was the first one out of the blue to me at first, like to jump in and to say, I want to be a part of that play. I want to be a part of this thing. Um, and I saw a, a huge shift to that. And then when the production actually happened, he, along with his parents, who had never really shown up to his school for anything, um, including like mandatory things, showed up. They showed up, they showed up with the tios, they showed up with the cousins that came from out of town, they showed up con los abuelitos, they showed up, they filled our tiny space, I was not a theater, but they showed up and they filled, and this was one of the events that had brought in uh, the most people, but not just the most people, but the most people for st students whose parents didn't really show up for things. Um, and that told me a lot there, that when the opportunities, when we put the opportunities there, people will show up. People show up when the opportunities there. People go say, oh, great, I've never, and uh, the things that they would all, that they told me, their family was like, wow, I like never been to anything for the school, and that was their first, again, sort of like back to my own, uh, what brought me to theater, like their, their entryway into it. Um, there was a, a show that I was also trying to do at my school, and I, with like being blessed with working with Teatro Vivo and, and being at the uh, Mexican American Culture Center, I had thought, okay, well, maybe this could be like an opportunity to have my students perform at the MAC. Maybe there's something that we can do there. And I reached out to uh, John and Rupert and kind of threw a little thing there. And it ended up not happening because I realized that that was also gonna be a struggle for our families to get downtown. Where, they're, where parking is a struggle, where um, really trying to figure out and trying to manage a place that they've never been to was gonna be a struggle. And I think those are places to explore to, to be able to produce theater and, um, and bring families to places they've never been. But I first realized I have to focus on the places that they are. And when it doesn't exist in the places that they have access to, like that's where I have to start. I have to start there, I have to start um, in a place that they feel comfortable with in a place that they already know how to get to, the, to our school. And so we did it in this small space that wasn't a theater um, because our parents knew where that was and, and, and they had access to that. And again, they showed up and I had, we had kids and families that had to sit up at the front, super close to the actors. And, and these were like young actors who was their first time doing theater and they were like, they're in my spot. Like, I, <laughs> how do I go around them? Like I can't, and I said, you know, you just, just very carefully, <laughs> um, and they did it, you know, and they did it, and they and and they managed to go through, the, get through the people, and get through the small uh, like little brothers and sisters that they had. Um, so I feel like from that I learned that when you think about accessibility for families, families show up, mm -hmm. and if families show show up, there's really no excuse why you wouldn't do the work, because like it's happening. Uh, I constantly think of every year, I think it's like the dramatics uh, 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 publication. publication. Um, they, every year they release the most produced plays and every year I'm heartbroken 
um, that it's the same place that have been done since 1950 something or another. It's constantly the same ones. When, to Cece's point earlier, the work is out there. The work is being published, everything is out there, and it's just how do we bring that into the, the spaces right from the very beginning, right from the elementary school level to really start rebuilding that culture of what school and what theater at schools can be with our families, and the families will show up. Yeah, yeah. They have, and they will. Yeah. And the, the young people who spoke this morning were talking about how they're, they're, they're doing teatro and they're speaking in Spanish in, in the theater and mm -hmm. then in school they're speaking in English. And th those two youth and most of the Proyecto Teatro youth I know are not participating in theater at school. Um, they're not, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll, uh, they could speak their own reasons why and perhaps ask them, but um, yeah. And along those same lines, um, uh, Abigail, sometime you need to tell us the story of the young person who walked in to see Cenicienta today and said, um, but that's Cinderella? Not even love this. Um, <laughs> right? the, um, because Cinderella, well, you tell the story sometime, but um, you tell it at the end. Okay, we're all on the edge of our seats. <laughs> Abigail to tell us. Okay, so um, thank you. Okay, so Miriam, along the same lines, so where have you found, and you mentioned some, some spaces where People are supporting the work and encouraging you, and of course we, you know, we all are, are grateful to Jose. I know he's a mentor to, to many people in this room. Um, where are those spaces? Where have you felt um, the, the the love? And and where are you like da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> to be well, very articulate? Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm living in Washington D.C. right now, um, and. Uh, from just personally what, where, where I've worked and who I've been in touch with. Um, I've been very supported, um, again, through my, Karen Zacharias sort of introduced me to all of this and got me connected to the Kennedy Center um, in computer and um, doing a, a wonderful program they had there for, for new playwrights, a boot camp um, that, that really was incredible, it was two weeks and so that was a wonderful place and right now in Child's Play have been incredibly supportive and connected me with really um, wonderful artists, Ricky um, and everyone there associated at Child's Play. Um, in DC, um, I they came to Right Now and I was connected with Janet Stanford of the Imagination Stage and um, they, get, they became very um, interested in working with me and then uh, with the Central American Refugee um, uh, a lot of unaccompanied minors were arriving in the DC area. Um, it was, I don't know, it was about four years, about three or four years ago, and um, the response was not was pretty ugly all over uh, the country and in DC as well. There were some ugly things happening, and we were, and she came to me and wanted to uh, to commission me to, to write this play, but also to create a program where we would bring in unaccompanied minors to Imagination Stage, and we did and we developed OYMA, which is still in. Uh, going strong at imagination stage, um, but also I would say um, that's where I've, I've found support. And I think I really do believe it's been personal connections and networking with people in places and spaces like this. Um, that's where I've really been able to. I mean, just today at, at the Rising Youth Theater uh, workshop and listening to the different stories, I was just really moved and reminded again about how many stories there are out there that need to be heard and how valid and important those stories are. Um, and that is the American story. And for some reason, and they've always been here, we're here, but it's just not been, uh, it's just not been allowed to be elevated to the stage. And we know why, we know why. But um, anyway, so that's, that's sort of where I found my support. I also, you know, Young Playwrights Theater in Washington, D.C. Um, I taught there, I was on the board there, but th again, I think organizations like Rising Youth Theater, Young Playwrights Theater, um, Albany Park Theater, um, the Detroit Mosaic Theater, um, these are the places where I really feel is the, is, is where the seeds are being planted to, to bring youth into theater, but also to make them our future leaders in theater, to get them 
onto boards to get them into the theater administrative staffs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's where the landscape will finally change once we start getting these folks. And those are, that to me is the, the exci very exciting part about YPT and Rising Youth and all of the other places that it's just um, critical. And when, if the more we cultivate that, the more we make connections with these folks, um, the more we have convenings like this, we'll start to see more work We'll start to see more connections and, and hopefully start building more bridges and, and, and unleashing all of these great stories out there and great talent. Um, so I, th I think it's about this. I mean, like, this is why it's so great. I think the how around Latinx, this convening is so critical. Um, I would like to say, though, that I know we're focusing on theatros, but I, I do feel like the larger theaters out there, like Imagination Stage and Child's Play and Seattle and where that um, they, I would love to see them coming to things like this to, to hear um, what we have to say, what's needed, how to open doors, how to um, get us to the table, and at, at Rising Youth, I love the latter where you talked about, you know, are we there to check a box, are we there really to be a part of the decision making, and to start sort of changing the narrative of Latinx theater, American theater, and changing that narrative, shifting um, the way we think about TYU theater. So I think, <laughs> sorry, <what>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, digging a little bit in there, Miriam. No. Changing the narrative, right? No. What's the narrative? What's the new narrative? What do you want I it to think, be? I think the new narrative is that um, what, is what is Latina, what is American? To me, what American is is a combina is is a blending and combination and intersections of everything. I mean, there's so many. Right now, I mean, we're 18 percent of the population by 2036 will be the largest ethnic population, and we're also mixing so much. There's so much inner gender, inner uh, ethnic racial mixing. It's it's everything, and that's what's so cool is that the the new narrative, the new story of who we are as Americans, is that we own it. Now we know some people want to make America great again, um, <laughs> and what that means. <laughs> but um, we know that America is what we what we've always been, and what we're defining it. And I think the the new narrative of what Latin TYA Latinx theater is is that it's part and parcel of who we are, and it's not marginalizing us. It's not separate. It's everything. I think that's the shift that needs to happen, and. Um, I think there's some really cool work being done. I'm, I'm on CTFA with C with CC as and with Jenny at Children's Theater Foundation of America. We're really trying to uh, dig deep. And Robin's here. She's on mm -hmm. some. And um, we're really trying to dig deep and look at institutional racism in in these organizations and really understand it and do the hard work and. Um, um, change the narrative and try to see how can we support theaters that are really doing good EDI, um, equity diversity initiatives, are th and doing the work and asking the hard questions and reflecting and figuring out how do we change so that we can uh, do some fundamental institutional systemic work. And that's anyway, what we're trying to do. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, we got a phone-in call. <laughs> Tuning in to us, and um, <laughs> Karen Zacharias in DC would like to know, no. <laughs> and it's a great question, so I cannot ignore it. But um, really important, um, right? We have, and speaking of, of some of our our TYA companies throughout the the country, and and please speak uh, uh, about this in Mexico. But we have such a need for adaptation. The book, right? Will it sell? And I know, right, Esperanza Rising, um, I remember people were like, well, it's, it's not a title that people know, but then we learned, oh, it is, right? Um, well, we, we fought to, you know, to fight, that was a fight. But anyhow, um, the, so, so what do we do about the idea of adaptation? How do we get companies to do original work? And also, I mean, right, you, we have folks here who've, who've done adaptations, um, and and what do you think about about that? What has that been like? Are, is that a great joy? Are you? Is it is it painful? What is that for you, for our playwrights, but also in, in your own work? And and why is that such a thing for our young people? Why it's 
it's continued. It's been a long time where the title, right, the book title and the adaptation, and I think I got her question right. Yeah, how do we get TYA to embrace original Latinx stories when there is no book behind it? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know! <laughs> I mean, I mean you know, I think adaptations are good. I mean, I think what they, the one purpose they serve is to build uh, bridges, you know? And so I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with adaptations. It's, I think it's for the artistic directors to, it's, I think it sometimes boils down to just economics and them, you know, understand, and it's hard to raise a theater, I mean, to, to survive in theater. So I understand why there's that, that hesitancy to, to not go with original titles. Um, but I think it's, you know, when like Miriam talks about, you know, when you, when you create that community that, is empowered and can say something, we'll see that change. But um, I think, because I think it's going to be a while, just because I think the economics plays such mm -hmm. an important role, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, if we can't, you know, do this play, then we won't do any plays, or we'll we'll go under. And so, like I said, I don't know. You know, I'm not in that space to say this is what we need to do. I just think it's it's taking artistic directors um, tasking to be brave. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly. Anyone else want to want to stab in that? And then we're going to open it up to more questions out there. Some, and I've been really selfish about asking all my <laughs> questions. I'm sorry, it's just so exciting. I so many. Okay, anyone else want to talk on that? No. CC's I don't know was was the final was the final answer. Okay, we have a question over here and then over there as well. I was just going to have an answer to that question. I don't really have a question. Thank you. You have an answer. We are all wanting to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> So the answer over there is, why not? Just just do it. Just do it. OK. Oh, thank you. Just do it. OK. <laughs> just do it. Yes. Kim Peter. Uh, you have to be subversive. Producers have to be smarter than they often are. We have to be subversive, and people, uh, producers need to be smarter. And? <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so moving to a next question, Olga. Oh, oh, we are we are full of contributions. Love it. <laughs> Olga's talking about te uh, Teatro Milagro. Go ahead. I, I'm doing this for the live streaming. Oh, so sorry. Go mm -hmm. ahead. But <laughs> they can't hear you, so. <laughs>
Thank you. Did we get any of that on? Uh, no. Okay. So just very briefly, Teatro Milagro doing work since 1980. A lot of uh, social issues, um, human sex trafficking, and many, many, many others, and uh, Dia de los Muertos. All kinds of family work to market it in a different way. Thank you, Olga. That was awesome. Questions? Osiris. A lot of people want to answer that. The question is about um, what's missing in the Latinx uh, TYA canon, specific communities that are not being represented. Um, I think it's out there just finding it and letting people know that it's there. That's, I, I, you know, like I said, with my book and hopefully doing another volume, the hardest part was like finding those stories that we knew they were out there, you know? And I think how do we as a community, how do we promote each other's work so we know that it's out there because it is out there but it's sometimes it's just hard to find. And I, I don't think it's missing. I just think, okay, please let us know that it's out there so that we can publish it, can produce it, we can share it with each other. For me, that's the biggest thing is trying to get the awareness out as a community so we know those stories are out there. Thank you. I, I think for me, um, it's about access and mentorship. Um, we, have, we, have to, we have to mentor, we have to teach what we've been taught. And if we weren't taught that, I hope we can learn to teach. Um, the artists are gonna show up. They're gonna show up. It's just being able to have that access of people who have the foresight to see talent, to, to, to nurture talent, and then you know, let them rip. But give them the support that they need to, 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 to find their voice, because it takes a while to find your voice. And um, Mentorship is important <coughs> because most of the time they don't have people who have gone through this. Uh, they're the first man, if you will. You know that film, uh, Neil Armstrong landing on the moon, right? We need a lot of, of those types of folks to say, we, you're good. You need to believe in yourself. And I see your talent, I see your vision, I see your heart. You know, but but it's also about a craft, and they and they need that support to, to develop their craft. Oscar. Um, yeah, I I think I was going back a little bit to, to that same point that the work is out there. Um, I know that with Teatro Vivo, we we do a new play festival every year, and and there's a lot of work that comes our way that you know with limited resources, there's only so much you can do. But the work is all out there, and we see it, um, and we see all literally from all kinds of topics and all kinds of just experiences, I'll say that, uh, of experiences from uh, non-binary Latinx stories to, um, uh, I think this was maybe two years ago, uh, we came across a story of, um, it was a uh, Latino-based story, but it was uh, from the perspective of a deaf community and a deaf family. And, and that was a little bit harder to, to sort of find resources for that in the sense that it's like when, when it hasn't been produced, it's like, oh, like, who do we know that has all this, you know? Or who do, what actors do we know um, in, in the city that, uh, that are deaf actors that, that we can help all put together? And sometimes they, that works out, sometimes they don't. Um, but now that, but we, now that we know, let's say, that playwright or we know that particular play, we need to be able to find a way to share that and say, you know what, we, we couldn't do that here, but, but how can I take your work, how can I take this um, and share it with people and say, here's something if you're able to, to help and, 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 and fund maybe this project or you have um, the artists that, that are able to do that, like here's the work instead of like, oh, we couldn't do it and then just kind of leave it there. The work is out there and it's, and it's all about that and about finding those resources and how you can share the work with people of, so easily through technology across the world. Other folks want to 
uh, dig into that? Mm -hmm. I just, it also makes me think a lot about the leadership in different organizations and even theater companies. So who is in the board of directors and taking a look of, okay, who are we? Are we representing the stories of the people we want to, like, do we look like the stories we're representing? And just also, I feel like there needs to be more groups of younger people who get together, produce work, do things, share stories. Um, I think that that's something I would like to. Okay, thank you. So then um, just to, uh, to dig a little more into what you asked, okay, it is because I think you asked about some specific communities, indigenous Latinx communities, if, if you will, um, Afro-Latinx communities. Um, so in this work that is available, are, so uh, I hear that it's there, it's just not being done, is that what I'm hearing? I, I think just, just today, on the first day of the conference and all the different workshops I've been at, I've heard so many different stories and what's needed. All of those stories are things that could be written about. I mean, just everything we heard today, uh, your story that you shared, someone else shared another story. I was like, I mean, there's so, we as a people are very, very diverse. We're, we're, not, homo we're not a homogenous group. <laughs> I mean, do you speak Spanish or not speak Spanish? Are you, uh, what, you know, you're a third generation versus a first generation? Are you, you know, uh, the indigenous, questions, colorism questions, uh, ha people with physical challenges, I mean, at the deaf community, um, and other, other, other physical challenges. I mean, there's so much. There's a never-ending supply of story. <laughs> there's just never, they'll never end, because mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, they never end. So it's a matter, like Jose said, of trying to get these stories on the page, seeing talent, harnessing that talent, and getting someone to help you say, go, you know, Karen once told me, shut up, go shut up, shut up, and go write a play. Mm -hmm. You need to go <laughs> shut so up and go write your play. <laughs> <laughs> once the story's on the page, is there a certain kind of Latinx story that our folks who are producing work in the U.S. want to produce? Is that a thing? Is there a certain kind of Latinx story that our theater companies in the U.S. want to do? Or no? I'm just, I really have that question. And then I'll open up it again. We have like time for one more question after that. Um, I'm on a journey right now with a, an adult play, but I, I've never saw, saw it as an adult play. It's, it's playing in regional theaters, but it's been a family play all along in my mind. And to watch new audiences come into traditional regional theaters with their families is, is such a beautiful thing. To, to sit in a house of 600 people and suddenly hear giggles <laughs> with a grown-up play, right? And, and everybody's enjoying it, right? From the little people to the grandparents. And I think that that's a place I feel where um, we can do more work. Our audiences are hungry for the work, you know? Mm -hmm. And we just have to find those right pieces that can be emerged because it's a, it's a different sort of animal. Yeah, and I would say, on top of that, it is family, and we think of this, TYA is family. And all of the, that generation, my parents, they, they're hungry for this stuff, they've never had it. So being able to fill across generations, it's a need that is universal in our population. And I would say, and I would think because we do, it is about humanity and, 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 and the humanness of, of us all, connects to everyone. And so that, that's what we need to, the ultimate goal is just for everyone to understand that this is a, an Amer these are American plays, they're universal, they tap on the universal, so. And also I think that uh, we're thinking about theater for children, for young people, but uh, look at us. <laughs> we're old guys <laughs> and we still have a, Heart of a child, so <laughs> we're just like children with some experience. That's it. But <laughs> we're all children. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay, I got the ick from Abigail Vega. So the great, the most beautiful thing is that these folks are not going anywhere because they have, you know, we won't let them. But also, <laughs> a quality that every person here shares is the incredible generosity of spirit and willingness to
to mentor and talk and share story. So, uh, so can I say that? that any of you, if you have more questions, which I'm sure you do, please, please ask. Um, they, you know, obviously their hearts are, are open. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate so much hearing from all of you um, this collective wisdom, experience, and, um, and passion. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. so much. Thank you.